This artist has been really important to me in figuring out what my work is about and how it means and how I want it to mean. And I think artists use other art to do that, or they should. You know, that's how you sort of refine what you're doing and where you're going, is when you find other people speaking in ways that um, you want to speak. I don't know the story of this painting, but it seems pretty private to me, and it seems pretty bold. Um, and, and it brings up a lot of things that I'm really interested in, which is really like the transcendent power of art, which you couldn't really talk about then. And then even in the 80s, you know, when postmodernism was a big deal, um, the way he, Philip Guston dealt with symbols and the like, s fact that um, symbols and representation the meaning of these are so socially constructive that the that transcendental power of it is impossible or something. He never invoked any of the irony or um, knowingness of sort of postmodern theory. It was all, always had this sort of comic line, very human, vulnerable. Um, and that was really important because when I was a young artist, everything was ironic, actually. And the knowingness, you know, and I, we were just looking at David Sally, you know, um, all representation had that, this sort of way that you could categorize and understand it. And Philip Gustin even said, I have no interest in clarity or meaning like that. This painting was done in 1969, just a year before this really, really scandalous exhibition, when, um, which was totally uh, dismissed by the critics uh, and incited a lot of anger because, of, because he had moved from these very, very beautiful abstract expressionist paintings, mostly using pinks and whites and blues, which he continued doing, to these sort of ham-handed, um, figurative and symbolic paintings of books and feet and um, these sort of clans figure. And of course, it's just, it's in his earlier work. He was a WPA artist, and he made these big allegorical paintings of these hooded figures, very allegorical, very much influenced by like De Chirico. I mean, really kind of ripping De Chirico off. And, um, but you know, there was something, well, they were, there was something young about them too, you know. I mean, they didn't, they were pretty flat and, somewhat empty of emotion and maybe a little bit didactic. When he, when he came back to representational figures, they had all the sort of lushness and painterly sophistication of the abstractions, which make them really moving. Um, so this one in particular, I think is quite amazing and has stopped me because most of, there are very few of his paintings that are this Ab where the background is this abstract, this sort of like celestial blue. I mean, this figure is sort of in no man's land. Most of the, I mean, I've never seen a painting like this of his, you know, like the, almost always are these wood grain slats and there's a room, even if it's not super defined, I mean, it's a space. It's not this sort of holy, holy celestial space. I mean, it seems very clear. It's a painter, he's pointing at the painting, paint covered, but sort of blood covered, really martyry. Um, and then that finger, which we know from art, if we've looked at any art, it's a Jesus finger or it's an angel. You know, it's sort of accusatory or it's pointing something out. A, lot, a really common symbol for him is the rope. But I think in this painting, it's not a rope. Although an intern of mine said, oh, I love that one with the rope. But it's not a rope. But you think it's a rope because he always has a rope. But it's, such, it's just a paint drip. And it's very clearly sort of self-referencing, it's just a paint line. Largely, I think it's the vulnerability that, that keeps it on, that, on the side of being true and not ironic and not, and not truly sentimental or narrative.